we have we have three questions from Chris Green, Jamal, and Ed Whalen. Jamal, we have two Greens and a and a Whalen here on the queue. So um, the questions were presented to the panelists, and now it's time for your responses. Why don't I start uh, because Chris directed his question at me. Uh, you're right. Congress would have had the power to regulate uh, slavery, including banning it under the Commerce Clause, but for the fact that the Constitution had specific provisions uh, uh, on slavery that took that off the table so that, um, for example, the Constitution has a specific uh, provision uh, allowing Congress to ban the slave trade after 1808, and the reason that was put in there was I think the framers of the Constitution would have otherwise understood that they, they could have had that power under uh, the, the, uh, the, the Commerce Clause. So I think, you know, slavery, my vision of, uh, you know, Congress has the power to regulate uh, market-based transactions that have interstate, cross, inter cross state lines and have interstate effects. Um, would give Congress certain pretty broad powers, but you you know whenever there's a specific provision governing something that is going to take that's always going to take uh, uh, priority. And incidentally, that was a point made to me way way back by Richard Epstein, who I greatly admire, uh, and uh, he kindly read a draft of my long article when I was an obscure, untenured professor. He didn't know me from Adam, and that was one of several points he made uh, to try to con because he he was the original uh, uh, commerce's trade uh, 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 scholar. Um, and one thing I didn't mention, uh, and I mentioned that because I was grateful to people like Epstein who took the time. And what I like about this conference, there's a lot of young scholars. So I was having dinner last night with several uh, uh, folks. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, you know, I was very impressed with uh, the papers presented yesterday by Jamal and Ilya, and it's, it's nice to include. And it's amazing, you know, you can look at this stuff, but what you miss. You know, I read this stuff, I say, how did I, how did I not see that? This, this kid, you know, <laughs> who doesn't have gray hair. <laughs> so, so you can te teach an old dog new tricks. But that would be my answer to your, to, to, to your question. The, the specific provisions about slavery would govern over a possible interpretation of the Commerce Clause that might be thought to include that power, because there's just simply no question that that, that, that was the big, one of the big compromises and that the Constitution al allowed states that wanted to have slavery to have it. Any, so I'll also uh, answer Chris's question. Um, uh, you asked, um, uh, might it be the case might there be a, a distinction to be drawn here between the other powers of Congress rather than the other powers of the government, I think is the way you put it. Um, I'm sorry? They're not the same thing. So this is what's important. Um, uh, I think what actually happened is that Madison and others uh, very tactfully and very carefully muddied the waters on this question. But strictly speaking, the powers of Congress are not the powers of the United States government. Certainly not. Every power of Congress is a power of the United States government, but the reverse is not true, if we're strict. Uh, the United States government has powers to fulfill its obligations. It has an eminent domain power, uh, presumably. It has uh, the powers to enter contracts. It has the powers to sue or be sued. Those are not powers of Congress. And those, I think, are some of the powers that any nation would have and that Wilson and others assumed, yeah, those come online. We're not going to have to enumerate those. Those are powers of governments. Nonetheless, the ambiguity that arises in talking about the enumerated powers of government or the enumerated powers of Congress is one that parties to the ratification exploited to maximum advantage, in my opinion. Uh, they weren't always perfectly careful about what they were saying, or to put it differently, they understood that they were saying things that were not perfectly accurate, but would uh, convey certain, um, certain views. Um, another one would be implied and incidental powers. On one construal, every incidental power that would be covered by the foregoing powers provision is an implied power. 
It's unexpressed, right? So when in a particular um, debate, the bank debate, say someone starts to talk about unexpressed implied powers, you don't know yet whether they're referring to those powers that come in via the foregoing powers provision or those that come in via the all other powers provision. And my general theory is that we ought to be very sensitive to these ambiguities um, and to recognize that these were very smart people with a lot at stake. They were good lawyers, just like good lawyers today would lawyer the matter uh, through and through and try to, to take maximum advantage. I think that was happening um, then as well. Um, I, I do think that the first Congress had the power to abolish slavery, um, not necessarily under the commerce power, but under the all other powers provision. It won't surprise you. And I think uh, some proof for that is the fact that Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania, had enacted an, a gradual abolition statute in 1780. And if you ask the question, under what constitutional authority did the state of Pennsylvania do that, you'd have to go to their all other powers provision. And I think the fact that so many states had begun to abolish slavery in one way or another, whether judicially or legislatively, is one major causal factor for what happened in the first Congresses, why that was such an intense moment. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, on behalf of a group of Quakers, came in, uh, uh, the, the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, came in and put a memorial to the first Congress, calling for Congress to abolish slavery. Franklin was at the convention. Maybe it was a frivolous argument, but maybe not. If it wasn't, it meant that he thought uh, Congress had that power. And James Wilson at the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention he's the only one of which I'm aware, was uh, clear that he thought the Constitution had laid the groundwork for abolishing slavery in this country. He said, I'm proud of that. The Anti-Federalists challenged him. They were more abolitionists than he was probably in Pennsylvania. And they said, how could you not uh, give us a government that could do this? And he said, no, on the contrary, we did. Uh, so that's apart from the 1808 clause and the question of importation. That's just a question of whether Congress, the national government, had that power. My view is that it did, but that the, uh, that was such a hot a dynamite kind of a thing to, to, to come to grips with. And the uh, Southern uh, uh, Congress people, congressmen at the time, were, were, were not prepared to let that be the dominant interpretation. They, they fought for a different interpretation and, uh, and uh, changed the change the discussion. Um, I'll stop there. I have to respond to Ed's question, but I want to see if Jack wants to jump in or someone else does. OK, should I briefly yeah, do that? So, so Ed asked, and I think this is a great question, couldn't it be the case that the all other powers provision, um, well, first of all, was uh, indicative of an awareness that the government was going to change? So one illustration might be the amendment process. How would one know that there might not be an amendment down the road that would refer to powers of government? By putting an all other powers provision into the Constitution, you would take care then and there of the delegation of power to Congress to make laws to carry that subsequent delegation into execution. And I think that's possible. I think an intelligent draftsman would do such a thing. Um, I don't think, though, that we can parse the all other powers provision simply to refer to the other powers vested in Congress or the other departments elsewhere in the Constitution, because that's what the last part of the all other powers provision does, and it would treat that crucial, crucial second part as mere surplusage. So we're going to violate Gricean conventional maxims if, in fact, that's the case. We will have put a, a kind of a, an an extra meaningless provision into the Constitution. Hamilton in his bank argument calls this a peculiarly comprehensive provision. And I think another thing that was going on here is that under the articles, there were debates among the delegates to Congress over whether a, a particular power was executive or legislative in nature. They thought the government had the power, but they weren't quite sure whether it was executive or legislative. And so you might think that's another explanation, Ed. We don't know yet exactly what we think about a particular implied power. Is it going to be Congress's power or the executives? And so we can cover the landscape by writing the clause this way. And that way, nothing gets through. We, we're sure that nothing gets through. And I think that might be an explanation as well. OK. Um, just uh, we, we have now a, a burgeoning queue. And let me just, uh, if we're going to, I'm going to still stick to the triad um, form. So the, 
The next, the next triad is Ilya, Tom Colby, and Steve Smith. So my question is about resolution six, and it seems to me that it's common ground to all of you, or, or almost all of you, that resolution six, if it is in fact the basis of the Commerce Clause or the Constitution in general, or Article One in general, it does give Congress nearly unconstrained power to regulate anything that might have some sort of interstate effect. And I want to suggest if you read Resolution 6, that may not be the case, particularly if you read it in a way that doesn't sort of give deferential, rational basis credence to whatever Congress might decide. So it says, uh, to legislate in all cases in which the separate states are incompetent, what that means, to my mind, uh, A, they actually are incompetent, not necessarily mere that somebody has a rational basis for thinking they might be. B, incompetent is a pretty strong term. It doesn't mean like the states would be less good at doing this than the federal government. It means they're actually incompetent to do it. Like, you know, I may be, if, if we have a, a legal document which says, well, Jack Balkan is allowed to write uh, law journal articles in my name when I'm incompetent to do so, it would not be enough to say, well, he's more competent than me as he clearly is. Uh, you would have to prove that I'm completely incompetent, which is, you know, a, a stronger uh, burden of proof. Uh, and, you know, this, the second language about uh, the harmony of these states may be interrupted by the exercise of individual legislation, that one I'm less sure about. Uh, but I suspect that what is meant by harmony here or disharmony is not merely anything that might cause some sort of disagreement between the states, but things that might cause some sort of serious conflict, like probably trade wars, for instance, I suspect uh, that they had in mind. Uh, and this is, I think, related to what Jack said about Lopez and Morrison and the uh, homeowners association situation. If you give Congress sort of rational base of deference in, in those cases, as Justice Breyer advocated in his Lopez dissent, then you know there is an argument there's an interstate effect. Uh, Breyer spells out a lot of evidence suggesting there might be. Same thing with Morrison, where Congress, as Justice Souter put it, piled out mountains of evidence about interstate effects. If we just say, well, it's going to be a rational base for believing it, those things have to go through. If, on the other hand, you're going to say, well, no, is there really a collective action problem? Is there really an interstate effect? Uh, we're not going to be deferential then the situation is different, but it's also different with respect to a wide range of other things, including the individual mandate, where people like me have said there actually isn't a collective action problem. Individual states could do this if they wanted to. So I think Resolution 6, even if it is the basis of the uh, Constitution, I wonder, can it actually do the work that the people citing it say it does without also being combined with a sort of rational basis deference, in which case Lopez, Morrison, uh, and the putative Homeowners Association case that Jack perhaps will want to file next Not time. Not putative, it's a real statute. I know it's a real statute. I, the, the case is putative because it, it, uh, so uh, what I meant to say is the, as far, as far as I know, nobody has, has claimed that this case, that this statute is outside of, or has filed a lawsuit saying the statute is outside of the federal power. So that's, sort of, that's my question, like uh, can Resolution 6 really bear this kind of weight without uh, being combined with a very highly deferential, rational-based approach, in which case even sort of these possible exceptions like Lopez and the like would, you know, would also not be exceptions. Tom Colby? Um, yeah, I, I have literally a thousand questions, so I will not ask them. Um, <laughs> I just want to make a, maybe an observation that I think is interesting, that the, the variety of papers that we have here kind of help us to think about um, you know, the nature of this conference, the nature of the institute that, that, that has invited us all here, the nature of the Constitution, the nature of originalism. I'm sort of thinking in particular about uh, Bob Shaw started his remarks by saying, you know, look, I'm old-fashioned. I think the Constitution is written in plain English. It's understandable by the people. And it, 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 it has a meaning that it was originally understood to have at the time of the framing. And John McHale's some of the things that he said in his remarks in his paper, what we have here is a carefully crafted language written by lawyers to be ambiguous. Um, and in fact, it is maybe even so sneaky, especially when they misrepresented what they said, that it was 200 years before a brilliant scholar actually realized that maybe there's something here we, none of us saw before. Um, you know, I, I think this is really going at what, what is this constitution and what do we do as originalists. Uh, my own view is, you know, as, as I've tried to, as I've written in the past, is probably closer to John's that the Constitution, it, it's, a, it's a basic principle of public choice theory that you cannot write a law, especially a higher law, 
on a highly controversial topic about which there is no agreement among the masses without phrasing it in such a way that it is susceptible to being read as acceptable to the various coalitions that are going to have to come together to ratify this thing. And so, the Con does the Commerce Clause empower Congress to abolish slavery? Well, in the South, they said it sure doesn't, and in the North, they said it sure does, and it was written that way on purpose. I think you just see that over and over again in all of the controversial areas of the Constitution, either that people read it to say what they want it to say, or at least they feel like, okay, this can be read either way, and, and we're going to punt this issue down the road. I know I've got arguments, and that's the best I can do right now. I, I just think that, you know, as tempting as it is, and as nice as it is to believe that the Constitution was written in plain English for the masses, if the Equal Protection Clause had been written in you know, plain language that had a clear meaning with regard to questions like affirmative action and segregation, it never could have gotten super ratification. That is true of the First Amendment, it is true of the commerce power, it is, to me anyway, I, that's the nature of the Constitution, and I think these papers sort of nicely illustrate two different ways of, of thinking about that issue. Steve Smith? Uh, this is a question, I guess, or an observation mostly for John. Uh, I might have to do with others. But um, everybody's commented on, uh, you know, this was sort of a brilliant paper in that it was so original, you know, brought to things that nobody has thought about before or noticed before, uh, this interpretation. And I wonder uh, whether that's sort of self-defeating in this case. In some of what I said. So, so, so let me just put it this way. You know, uh, Jack says, well, you ought to move away from the sort of Straussian cast that you've given to the to the paper so far and um, and it's not clear that you really could very well because it's not just that representations made by by federalists and so forth um, were, were part of that but the whole structure of the Constitution you might think is already part of that. it would just seem sort of odd to have a constitution written where you've got article 1 section 8 with like 17 17 powers listed and then another one that says, and the four go, you know, the aforementioned powers, and then a line that says, you know, all those, and, and, and somebody's supposed to know that that meant the preamble or, you know, something of that sort. So, so, so the whole thing is written in this sort of, on your interpretation, on this sort of stealth strategy, it seems. Um, now, if, but that could still be true. You could be right that that's what was done, and that would be kind of interesting historically. But then if you try and think, on what theory of interpretation then would that be acceptable as the meaning of the document? It seems to me that it wouldn't be acceptable on an intentionalist view because the, you know, even if Wilson and others hoped to achieve something like this, I think an intentionalist view has, usually will say something like the meaning is the semantic intention. It's what, uh, what the authors intended to communicate. And by your view, I think they didn't intend to communicate that sort of power, if anything, they intended not to communicate it. Um, on a sort of a more public understanding view, it seems like then that wouldn't come across as the meaning of the document. So to my mind, it would be only on some sort of untenable formalist view that said that's what the language meant, even though they didn't under, uh, intend people to understand that, and the people didn't understand that, you know, but the, somehow they got it in there. Uh, uh, now, to my mind, that's not a very tenable uh, account of interpretation or meaning. So if I'm right, I'd end up with, a, again, a still kind of very fascinating, you know, historical account of what may have happened, but not one that would give us much that on any viable theory could count as the meaning of the Constitution. Okay, panelists. Can I, I start with just talk about what Elia said? Yeah, um, because um, I think you're, you put, you're right on the money, Elia. Um, and I want to make three points related to what you're saying. First of all, there's not one single way of cashing out what, uh, what Resolution 6 would have meant, even if everybody were agreed that, in fact, it's the, it's the appropriate structural principle to interpret the text today. First of all, because you have to add it to McCulloch. And once you add McCulloch, right, then Resolution 6 really, really does a lot. And by the way, when I say add McCulloch, because Jennifer's going to have her paper later, I mean the Whig slash Republican Party version of McCulloch, not the Democratic Party version of McCulloch. Because the Democratic Party version of McCulloch and the antebellum era is very narrow. It's the Whigs and the Republicans who have a, this more expansive view, or even the, the modern view of McCulloch. It's that plus the general abstention from judicial review after the New Deal, which, is combi which combined with the understanding of Resolution 6 creates 
the justification of the modern administrative regulatory state. It's entirely possible to have a, a system that sees this subsidiarity principle, right, because that's what Resolution 6 is, um, in a way that's much narrower and has much more robust judicial review. And one way of understanding some of the constructions that were added in the 19th century between manufacturing and commerce, manufacturing, agriculture, and commerce, between direct and indirect effects, between uh, the state's police powers and inspection laws and other things, were ways of trying to, in a rough way, make distinctions between things that were local by nature and didn't have lots of spillover effects from things that were national or federal by nature and had lots of spillover effects. Now, it turns out that each of these way stations doctrinally proved to be, you know, not workable. But it doesn't mean that you might not try to do this again. And indeed, that's one of the things I think Randy, in particular, is trying to do in the ACA litigation. He's trying to come up with yet another way of, of making a separation between local and national. So that the, the fight over Resolution 6 is somewhat shadow boxing over different fights, fights over judicial review, fights over the possibility of coming up with clear lines to demarcate between what's local and what's national. Now, I have views on this, and my views are not shared by everyone. But I do understand that, that my way isn't the only way that you can make sense of these materials. Um, I was, could I briefly talk about the, um, uh, the Resolution 6 uh, point? And, and I also agree with you, Ilya, that there are different ways to, um, to understand the resolution, as, as they put it at the time. That's the beauty of it. Um, all of these resolutions could be understood in a broad or, or narrow form. Um, and so it's possible to understand Resolution 6 in a fairly narrow form. Um, of course, I think that's I think that's exactly what happened. Um, it was simply a placeholder. Um, it wasn't itself um, meant to stand as any kind of broad proposition of federal power for federal problems. It simply was a placeholder that could ultimately go in a narrow or a broad direction. As Jack Rayko um, has written, they ultimately chose to go in a narrow direction. Um, they ultimately chose to uh, simply use a vehicle of um, specifically enumerated um, enumerated powers. So I, I I agree with you. And the way I put it in my paper, what what I'm arguing against is, um, is a specifically broad rendering of Resolution 6 um, um, and the claims that that was historically um, adopted at the time. Um, in terms, and, and then in terms of whether or not, you know, uh, if we use that principle today, whether or not there would be any kind of stopping point or whether or not it would um, accomplish everything you'd like it to, to accomplish, just use the flag waving uh, point. If we use Resolution 6, um, as the basis for federal power, I think it very easily uh, justifies federal, uh, federal bans or federal control over local condominium uh, uh, organizations uh, trying to control whether or not people can wave a flag. If you doubt that that can be considered as a national problem, then you simply have to read uh, Gobitis, um, and you get a very clear articulation about how patriotism and the inculca uh, inculcation of patriotism um, implicates the deepest and most important national interests, particularly in, in times of war. Um, and it would very much be a, a national problem if people on a local level were being prevented from inculcating patriotism through uh, the waving of a flag. And Gobitis was uh, overruled, of course, because it ultimately ran against a specific enumerated right. Right, It was a state law at the time, but it ran up against a, an enumerated right. Um, but I, I think it's, it's an extraordinarily broad principle um, and one that really doesn't have any stopping power at all. And I certainly think you, under Resolution 6, you would easily come uh, to different conclusions in, uh, in Lopez and Morris, and you'd be able to construe those as national problems. You'd be able to construe anything that the national government thought was a national problem as a national problem. So uh, briefly on Ilya's point, um, I just want to mention that uh, the, the provision that uh, uh, ascertains the extent of government power with reference to what the states are competent to do was not new on the scene in 1787, nor in Wilson's bank essay. This goes back to Benjamin Franklin's first draft of the Articles of Confederation, had that provision in it, actually. That was the proposal. That's how we're going to decide what Congress uh, 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 has as its powers. It's what the states aren't competent to achieve. And this was a point of dispute. It was a major fault line right away. Um, and so, one thing that means is that by the time you get to 1787, this is something everybody is familiar with. Uh, the fact that it's in Resolution 6 is interesting, I think. I think, personally, it means that there was a kind of burying of the hatchet at the outset of the convention, as between primarily Virginia and Pennsylvania. Um, 
and we're going to go forward with this as the guiding principle. It may still have been a placeholder. I think that that's actually pretty plausible, that uh, these individuals didn't think that that language was necessarily going to survive in the Constitution for reasons of the kind that you're pointing out. You know, do you really want to litigate the competence of the state? Or do you want the language to say something else so you're falling under a different provision? And I think that that may have been a factor um, as well. But it's important to realize the history. This is a, a something they've been around the track on this quite a while. And the fact that there's an agreement at the outset of the convention, when Virginia still thought it was going to control the government, at the end of the convention, there was an agreement. When after the, uh, the major compromise midway through the summer, Randolph and Mason and others pull back. They, don't, they no longer want the national government to have this kind of a broad sweeping power, and that's part of the dynamic that, that we have going forward. Um, on uh, Tom, I agree with what you have to say. <laughs> won't surprise you since you were agreeing with me, I guess. But I just do think that we ought to think of it in these terms. And maybe one added um, remark here is that we're all now accustomed to reading John Marshall opinions through the lens of his canny sophistication, misquote, quoting the Constitution, you know, uh, dodge, weave, ambiguous results. That, and we're, we're accustomed to reading uh, judicial decisions today in that light, right? What was the principle that came out of Lawrence versus Texas? What was the message to the lower courts as to the new boundaries, right, going forward of ascertaining uh, uh, rights under various provisions of the Constitution? The, the message was, it's muddy, go figure it out for a while and then come back, you know, we'll come back and revisit it later. And I think that that's probably what went on in the drafting of the Constitution. Um, and then briefly to Steve's point, I am quite sensitive to uh, writing a paper that comes across too much as uh, proposing a stealth interpretation and being just too far out of the mainstream on this. And I don't think that would be good strategy for getting people interested, um, for one thing. Um, but um, so I, I, I take your point, and I need to think a little bit about how it ought to be written. Partly, I haven't uh, really, I don't feel like I understand actually what went on, how much of it was a hiding of the ball. There's a case to be made that it wasn't that much of hiding the ball. I mean, the preamble does have those purposes. If you go to Ilya's paper yesterday, the question of political ignorance, suppose you could take a poll at the time, and the question you would ask the people uh, who are reading the Constitution, do you think the new government has the power to promote the general welfare? or to establish justice or to do any of those uh, objects in the preamble, I imagine the overwhelming opinion of the uneducated as well as the educated would be yes. It's only later when you get an enumerated powers doctrine that uh, now it looks stealthy somehow to craft a document that flags obje objects at the outset and uh, somehow those are not attainable by the government even though it looks like those are the purposes of the government. The, any corporate charter ought to be drafted in such a way that the corporation can achieve the purposes for which the corporation was created. And the Constitution ought to have been drafted to achieve the purposes for which the Constitution and the government was uh, enacted. So I'm not sure at the end of the day how stealthy or unstealthy individuals were and how we think of that issue, but I take your um, point and I'll try to uh, uh, incorporate it into the next draft. Uh, okay. and, well, I, I wanted to respond, oh, sorry. if I could. Um, as for Ilya, I agree that a rational basis approach to Resolution 6 and implied powers would let Congress do anything. And I find it significant. I was working on my article without any idea of what Kurt was doing, and we happened to come to the same conclusion. Um, uh, so we both thought that, you know, the, the delegates at the convention deliberately did not give Congress general legislative powers, uh, but specified them. And as for um, Tom's point, I mean, I agree with, with you and John that, you know, lawyers are very clever in drafting documents. I don't doubt compromises were, were made. Uh, the Constitution was carefully drafted. There was some deliberate vagueness and ambiguity. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, the, the, the framers pinned their hopes entirely on the text of the Constitution because their records were kept secret. Um, and, you know, of course, words contain some vaguenesses, and there are various possibilities. So the question is, what was the most likely meaning? And I think that's especially true when you're talking about the structure of government. 
if you're looking at a word like freedom of speech, I'm willing to concede that's more open-ended, but when you're talking about the powers of government, I think it's more careful. Um, I'm not aware that of any evidence that when the framers drafted the Commerce Clause, that it was the product of some deliberate vague, we're gonna use the word commerce, because it has 19 possible meanings. Uh, uh, and we're hoping that somebody eventually will say, you know, intercourse is the meaning, or this is, you know, that, that to me doesn't seem to be a very smart way to draft a constitution. For example, in Article 3, we set up courts. Well, the primary meaning of a court was a, a princely residence where they held forth. Another was an enclosed area where you play games like tennis. I mean, yeah, I could say, well, they might, courts, I mean, we, we got it all wrong. The Supreme Court should just be a tennis complex, you know. That, that's, that's a meaning of court in, in, in 17, go to the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, you know, so I think, you know, we, 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 you know, people are laughing. So, I mean, we all agree that, 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 that some meanings, uh, words that can have a range of meaning, some meanings are a lot more plausible than, than, than others. So I, mean, I don't want to say that there's only one possible uh, uh, original meaning. I'm, I want to say there's one that's usually most likely. You know, and just very quickly, I just want to follow up to the, jumping in here. We're a three-headed monster, right, or more. Um, uh, I, I just want to talk about the unwanted, unwanted uh, pregnancy model of constitutional interpretation, um, since we're talking about intercourse and things along those lines. Uh, I've, never, <laughs> I've never really understood this approach, right? It's that, you know, the, the suitor um, and, and the person they're pursuing, you know, say yes, yes to um, our union. Um, no, 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 I, because I'm, I'm worried that if, with this union, terrible things will happen. Um, uh, no, don't worry, nothing will happen, you'll be fine, power will be limited. Uh, just say yes, just say yes. Um, and uh, so they, they give in, they say yes to the union, and then bam, pregnant language. Um, uh, suddenly you have an unwanted uh, federal government that had been promised otherwise. I don't, that's no way to run a, a government. I don't understand how that can fit any kind of model of self-government. That's some type of, uh, you put one over on the ratifiers uh, when they were the ones with the sovereign right to decide what their fundamental law was. I'd, I've just never understood that as, an, as a normatively attractive approach to constitutional interpretation. All right, our next, uh, just, just so I can assure people who's who are on the queue, that they are on the queue. Uh, the next triad is uh, David Upham, Mark Muller, and Mike Rappaport. The next triad after that is Mike Paulson, Jennifer McAward, Brian Weilenthal, and um, then uh, we have a, a burgeoning, I, I'm gonna, Stanley, and I'm gonna put myself on the, the, the next one, and, and, and Stephen, okay, so there we go. Uh, David. Uh, I guess um, a few comments here. One address sort of to all the papers, just a, a, piece of, a piece of evidence that I just don't hear cited as much as maybe it should, is in Federalist 17 when Hamilton says that regulating agriculture, uh, justice between citizens of the same state, no way it would be usurpation for Congress to do it. Now, for them to say that to the anti-Federalists, yeah, it would be a kind of trickery. And I think it's not just normative, it's also even, again, positive law. These preamble says it ordained by the people I don't think the people ordain things by being by deception. They themselves aren't when the anti-federal when, when the anti-federalists aren't convinced the New York Convention and say, "Okay, we agree." They're they're agreeing to this. <laughs> what what was represented to them, not something that wasn't. Um, a couple points to uh, to John McKyle's paper. I didn't think in your paper you gave sufficient attention to to the to the language vested by this Constitution in this. Because that's, a, that's a, all of the powers vested by this Constitution. If I always took that to mean the, you're going to look around the rest of the Constitution and find powers in this, and again, the, you know, the demonstrative adjective, this thing, not some, something else. Um, you mentioned uh, a minute ago that the preamble's purpose is include established justice. And maybe you do mean it as, as radical as this, but if that's the case, that Congress has all power to, make, uh, to establish justice, then you're, I mean, you're pretty much anything. I mean, you can, you can do it all. Uh, if that's what um, uh, the foregoing powers or, f or other, other powers mean. Um, lastly, uh, in response to, uh, to Jack Balkin, um, a couple things about uh, uh, one objection, one uh, 
response to an objection. First, the text, because the text, in, I mean, this is um, it's nothing new, but it's a lot of redundancy arguments that could be made about commerce, meaning, I mean, the full faith and credit power of Congress, that deals with things going together. I mean, there's, there's countless redundancy arguments that could be made, other powers that look like, well, why even, you know, commerce covers it all. Um, why do you have that there? And then the second thing you mentioned, the, uh, the, you know, the, the convenience problem, I think, is that, well, a lot of things we want the federal government to do, and it has done for a long time, uh, have to be reconciled. And I guess there's three responses. Well, it's been all been bad, <laughs> first. <laughs> uh, secondly, maybe there are other powers that are pretty robust, like uh, you mentioned interstate um, biohazards, but there's, you know, there's powers, interstate tort claims, that the courts have jurisdiction to hear the judicial power is supposed to ha handle those things, the judicial and the necessary and proper clause to carry into execution that power to resolve other things. And then finally, again, the Constitution has provisions that deal with necessary failures, and that's Article 5. So when it's necessary, Congress propose it. And if it's necessary, they can do it, uh, propose amendments. Um, so this question is for John. So, John, I thought this was, a, this was an awesome um, article. Um, is really, uh, really interesting. Um, my question is, so sometimes when you talk about all other powers, you seem to be referring to it as kind of a repository for um, broad, unenumerated regulatory powers. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's another way to look at the all other powers provision that's I, I think consistent with some of the quotes from Wilson that you cite, which is that truly referring to the power to have take actions that alter the government's rights and obligations that vest in the government as an entity, as a corporate entity or sort of right holder. So entering into contracts, um, buying property, managing property, um, altering legal status um, by suing or being sued, those sorts of things. I mean, even incorporating public corporations is kind of establishing a principal agent relationship. So, I mean, if that's what it's referring to, I think it's important and it fills in a number of gaps in our kind of understanding about where some of the federal government's powers come from, but it's not quite as broad and, and, and as open-ended as, as I think you sometimes seem to be suggesting. So, uh, two points. So first, um, Thompson is point, which is we, we commonly hear, and it's a, you know, I, I certainly agree as a matter of public choice theory, it's, it's, it makes a lot of sense that we've got vague language, people can then sign on to um, the vague language and everyone can be happy and, and go home. Um, and that's certainly one possibility. Uh, that, that's obviously not the only possibility when something is getting enacted. There, there's other possibilities. And, and one thing that I'm sort of curious about when trying to think about um, both the original Constitution and, and the, the Reconstruction Amendments in particular is how er does, and I'll put this to the group, um, what, are there examples of people <coughs> saying this kind of thing early on? It would be very interesting to know whether they, uh, now on the one hand you, you, you might say, well, they, they wouldn't say it in public. But, you know, we've got a lot of information. <laughs> uh, we've got private letters and so on. It'd it, it be, you know, Madison sort of writes to Jefferson, well, you know, who knows what this means. Um, and I, I, I ask this question, you know, quite genuinely. I, I'd be very interested to know, you know, when does this start, the, the, the public recognition of this point. Of course, the fact that they might not even be unaware of what they're doing, right? So it's, it's just a very interesting question to me. Um, how far back we can trace this. And then one small point, um, so I think it was Chris who raised the point about um, abolishing slavery and uh, Bob came <coughs> back and said, well, um, they have the slave trade clause. Um, but that sort of just raises the question sort of, you know, further, right? So, so um, and then I guess there's two ways to put it. Well, if they thought they could abolish slavery, if everyone thought they could abolish slavery, then the slave trade clause is kind of a little bit weird because they, they said, well, you can abolish slavery, <laughs> uh, but just don't abolish the slave trade, right? I, I mean, it'd be, let's say they had, so in, in 1795, they could abolish slavery, but 
they still got to allow slaves to be brought in. I guess, you know, when, once they're brought in, they're freed or something like that. But it's just a very, it, it's an odd construction. It doesn't mean it's impossible to, to reach that. You could say, well, they were worried about the slave trade. No one was really thinking seriously they were going to abolish slavery. But, but um, I just thought that was, um, raised more complications than, than uh, maybe Bob was giving it. Okay. Um, comments from the from the panelists. Uh, can I just say a little bit about the very interesting, uh, also David's point, which is really, I think, spot on, uh, about those two things. First of all, the, you've just opened up a whole can of worms with the slave trade clause. It turns out, there's a wonderful book, by the way, if you're interested, called Slavery and the Commerce Clause, which I recommend to you, which is really interesting on all this. Part of our problem is that if we think that we're bound by the understandings or expectations of what could have been done, it's very hard to understand a lot of things today. So um, they didn't think that slavery could be abolished under the powers they had given the government. But there were certainly folks who could make lawyers' arguments about the ability to abolish slavery. The slave trade clause is premised on the idea that slavery would eventually die out in the United States. Well, how would it die out? Probably through, through uh, uh, statutes of emancipation in, the, in several states. And some states, though, wanted to continue to be able to import slaves, largely because they were going to then turn around and sell those slaves to the new western states that were developing. So I think it was Georgia and South Carolina were the two states that insisted on the slave trade clause because they said, we want to keep, you know, there's a wonderful business in Kentucky and Tennessee uh, and Georgia that we'd like to, you know, keep going. Um, so the, what it's, and it's also, it turns out that that clause isn't just about slave trade, as you know, it's about migration and importation. And it presumes a power over immigration. It presumes that there's a power over immigration. And when they're asked, when somebody says, well, what's the source of the power? I think it's Rutledge who says it. it, it might be, I think it's Rutledge who says, oh, it's the commerce power. The commerce power is the power that we have over immigration, um, which suggests a really interesting, you know, this is a piece of information that's relevant to the reasons why I adopt the view that I do. So that what we have is we have a very complex story in which we're not quite sure exactly what they thought was possible, but we also uh, believe that they, they, certain things were off the table. And there's a huge debate over the period of time just coming up to 1808 as to what exactly they can do and what they can't do. It's not settled, in other words. It's precisely because they know the magic date is about to occur. And they're going to pass a statute of some sort around 1808. And what is the statute they're going to pass? And the statute they ultimately pass is really interesting because it's a statute that not only regulates the slave trade, but also regulates the kinds of ships you can have. That is to say, you can't build certain kinds of ships that would be useful for transporting slaves. Right? This is, goes back to the, regula the power over navigation, which is established in this. David makes this really, really important point, although you're making it through the language of sh why shouldn't we just use amendment. The, 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 it goes to the question of how our notions of interpretation are driven by theories of legitimacy. And there are two different, at least two different accounts of the relationship between a theory of interpretation and legitimacy. Here's one. One theory of legitimacy is that the legitimacy of the Constitution and the constitutional system rests upon the initial act of adoption and on subsequent act of adoptions of amendment, right? And that anything which is in derogation of those acts lacks democratic legitimacy. Now, this is a very familiar idea in the literature. But there's another idea in the literature which, is, uh, which takes you in a slightly different direction. It's that the legitimacy, the democratic legitimacy of the Constitution as a system as a whole depends on the initial act of adoption and the acts of amendment. But those by themselves are not sufficient to secure the democratic legitimacy of the Constitution in practice. What's necessary for the Constitution in practice to be, remain democratic legitimate is that it has to be responsive to the uh, needs, values, and concerns of the generation that lives under it. So that is to say, legitimacy is established both by the generation that creates the document and any generation that adds to it through amendment, but also any generation that is forced to live under it. In other words, it has to be their constitution. Now, you put your finger on the problem when you say, well, we live with this, this New Deal synthesis, New Deal civil rights synthesis, but in fact, it's not the New Deal the synthesis that anybody at the time of adoption would have uh, thought attractive. Right? 
And so the question is, what's the source of its legitimacy? And the source of its legitimacy can't simply be the act of adoption in 1787, because we know that the folks who lived at that time, that generation, would have found this a very unattractive way of running a federal government. On the other hand, right, we would find it extremely unattractive to live under their understandings of how to run a federal government. So the source of legitimacy has to come from two sources. And the problem of constitutional interpretation is how do we synthesize these two competing demands of democratic legitimacy? And so everybody has a different way of doing it. So for example, living, living originalism, which is my book, tries to do it through the distinction between original meaning and original expected application, and between interpretation and construction. Right? And Michael and John's book, which is coming out soon at uh, fine bookstores near you, uh, tries to do it through a combination of a story about original meaning and also through a theory of the kinds of constructions, we don't use constructions, but judicial updatings that would be considered appropriate given the way we, where we are now and the kinds that would be considered inappropriate given where we are now. We have a very complicated and elaborate set of ways of explaining this problem. And so they're responding in some ways to the same problem I'm responding to, but they're doing it in a slightly different way. And Scalia has a third view. Scalia's view is we start with the original meaning, but then we accept as just basically settled a series of uh, stare decisis principles, stare decisis decisions that are just in derogation of the Constitution. And we just accept them because it would just be too expensive or too unsettling or too annoying for us to basically get rid of them. So each of the three of us, or four of us, depending on how you want to count, John and Michael, have, are trying to solve this problem of synthesizing legitimacy produced by adoption from legitimacy produced by lived experience. And we're giving three different answers to the problem. But you have put your finger on the problem. I think it's the crucial problem of doing constitutional interpretation. Let me respond to uh, David's point that uh, you know, Congress can't regulate agriculture. Uh, and I'm going to say something that will bring a smile to Jack's face, which is I think the Commerce Clause has the same legal meaning today that it had in 1787. It's the voluntary sale of goods and services in the market that have interstate impacts. What's changed really are brute facts on the ground. Uh, I mean, farming was local in 1787, but you know, gradually and by the 20th century it became national and international. Not because we amended the Constitution, but just because of changes in transportation and technology. So like Jack, I'm willing to say that the meaning is not frozen to the intended applications of the clause in 1787. Um, as for Mike's point, um, uh, uh, you know, are there examples of people saying, hey, we're just making this stuff up deliberately and just throwing words down because we got to push it past the rubes out there. Uh, uh, but then later, we're just going to interpret however we want. I haven't seen any evidence of that. Um, uh, uh, and that would be, I, I think, a little bit startling, given the ideals that the framers were espousing, especially about popular sovereignty and the need for ratification by the people. And people like James Wilson really sincerely believed in popular sovereignty. Um, now, as far as the, 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 the slavery, I, I probably spoke imprecisely earlier. There is a difference in my mind between the slave trade, and I think under the Commerce Clause, you know, uh, slaves were, were property. That, that's the horror of slavery. And, and, but, you know, buying and selling property could be regulated uh, under the Commerce Clause. That, that's different than, than slavery itself, the institution. And it seems to me that there's no question whatsoever that the Constitution allowed each state to decide whether or not to allow slavery. That was everybody under, a lot of people didn't like it, but that was the under, that was the compromise. Without that, you don't have the South, you don't have the United States. Um, uh, so I just want to distinguish between the slave trade, which has to do with commerce, the institution of slavery itself. So. I can brief, briefly re respond. Um, David, I think you're spot on on vested by this Constitution. I think I don't adequately deal with that particular language in my paper. Um, several of my colleagues um, have suggested that already, um, and I think I, have to, I, I, I need to. I want to say something about this idea that an implication of the view that I'm proposing is unlimited government. We've just gotten 
uh, gone over the top, right? That several people have mentioned that. And I think there's a potential um, misunderstanding um, here that I want to try to, uh, to clarify. So there's a difference between strong government and unlimited government. James Wilson, who I think was integral in this story, was absolutely a proponent of limited government. He had spent a decade railing against the unlimited government in the state of Pennsylvania that uh, was a, a consequence of their unicameral legislature and no good separation of powers. We shouldn't forget that Wilson was the person who put proper into the necessary and proper clause. And I, my own view is that the best understanding of what he contemplated by putting a proper requirement uh, is in fact similar to what Gary Larson has argued that uh, on federalism, separation of powers, and individual rights grounds, the, uh, the courts would be able to invalidate legislation on the grounds of its being improper. In the bank essay and parts of the essay that I don't quote, Wilson makes the point that the state of Pennsylvania is doing something improper by pulling a charter back that has vested rights in individuals. Uh, he, he draws an analogy to immigration. It's an interesting argument. He says, can our legislature really do anything? Suppose a legislature sets up an, an immigration and a naturalization scheme, someone becomes a citizen, and then later the legislature decides, nope, we're gonna change the law, you're no longer a citizen. He would say that's an improper law and it could be invalidated. And there were other features of the Constitution that for him meant that what was being created was a limited government, bicameralism, federalism, separation of powers, judicial review, individual rights. When Wilson and other founders talked about unlimited government, they had in mind things like parliament, and they had in mind things like, uh, like the Pennsylvania State Constitution of 1776, not what they had just created. But none of that entails that the national government can't be very strong once it complies with all of those limitations. And so he, I think, wanted a very strong national government, but one that would live within those constraints. Um, on Mark's question, um, I think you're right that those are two different ways to think about what's going on here. Is it broad regulatory authority? And I kind of say that at the end, partly to make the argument more exciting, I think, and enticing for us today. But it might very well have been that what Wilson and others had in mind were those kinds of things that you were talking about, those sort of powers that vest in the government as a government con uh, con contract and um, regulation of land. Again, I say in the paper, and it's very important to recognize that this competence point, under the articles, Virginia said it was competent to decide uh, on the determination of the Western lands, what became Ohio, the Northwest Territories, Ohio, Indiana, uh, Illinois, and the like. And the nationalists like Wilson, who were also the owners of the corporations who had the land titles, said, no, you're not competent. That has to be a national question. We've all spilled blood and treasure to acquire this territory. We're not gonna simply let one state now, just because it has a charter that uh, claims uh, a, a territorial jurisdiction from sea to sea, now uh, uh, unilaterally decide the disposition of this land. That's a national question. We've just fought collectively to uh, acquire the, the jurisdiction. And that's really what was at stake. It's another reason why competence was such a loaded term. And then I'll just say briefly on the slave trade clause, I have a slightly different understanding than Jack, I see this as a debate between Virginia and South Carolina. Virginia had a surplus of slaves. And whether we like it or, it or not, it's a very ugly thing to think about, but I think what was going on was South Carolina wanted an open market and Virginia wanted a protected market. Mm -hmm. Virginia wanted to be able to sell its surplus of slaves to the West, as Jack uh, mentioned, and South Carolina wanted a, a more favorable market in which it wouldn't have to buy slaves only from Virginia, uh, but could import and keep prices down. Um, this is why uh, quite incongruously, it seems, George Mason and Patrick Henry and the others at the Virginia Ratification Convention can at one moment be very, very upset about the, the, the trade importation aspect and another say, you know what? The government has the power to take away our slaves. They said both of those, uh, both of those things. And I think the Virginians were just pushing this line, including Madison, um, trying to press Virginia's interests and South Carolina was pushing back, arguing for an open market. And essentially the point is, it was going to be a legislative matter. I disagree with Bob. I don't think that the Constitution 
precluded the national government from abolishing slavery. What it did, though, was make it a legislative matter, and it, it wasn't in the cards at all for the national government to abolish slavery. That, that wasn't going to happen. But what might have happened was uh, a modification of trade, and that's what 1808 did. It gave us a, uh, an extension to that point. All right. Um, the next trio is Mike Paulson, Jennifer McElward, and, and Brian Weldon. I find it disturbing how much I sometimes agree with you. <laughs> I, in, in terms of broad national powers, I, I have a commerce question and then maybe a necessary proper clauses question. Commerce question is directed to uh, Bob's theory. Bob, just let me know where I come from. I think Wicker versus Filbert is rightly decided. Okay, I know it's one of yours that is, is wrongly decided. And you, you have this, you know, it's got to be voluntary and market oriented. Um, when I think of market-oriented, though, I think of cumulative economic impacts. Okay? I don't know why, why, in your view, isn't the economic effect of wheat grown at home, okay, and for home use, uh, market-oriented activity? I, I also I'd like to hear more on voluntary, because it does seem to replicate in a slightly different way the uh, uh, action-inaction distinction. And I, I first raised my hand when you were, when you were saying that, of course, in, in the first round of answers on slavery, you could abolish, there, there would have been a power to abolish slavery. Um, as to purely intrastate slavery, um, would that have counted, in your view, as a market-oriented relationship? Now, you know, how, how, do you, how do you cash that out? My, my question on necessary and proper clauses uh, is inspired by Jack's Freedom to Display the Flag Act. Actually, when, uh, when I was in OLC and we were looking at passing flag-burning statutes and constitutional amendments, a bunch of us had a discussion as to where the power to prescribe a flag of the United States actually comes from. The only thing that I can think of is this all other powers of the government. I'd like to hear people's reactions. Um, Jennifer? Um, I think Mark and David pretty much covered my comments, which related to how do we identify what the other powers are, and then the mechanism by which those powers are vested in the government, and how that constitutional <coughs> term might the understanding of that constitutional term might inform it. Sounds like a new article for you. Brian? Yeah, I mean, like everyone else, I'm, and I'll, this is kind of directed mainly to John McPyle on the necessary and proper issue. I am incredibly impressed by this paper. It seems there are two sides of it. There's this historical evidence, which I was unfamiliar with, even unaware of most of it, and I think that I would want to chew on quite a while. And, and the history part of it could, if it, uh, you know, if this it holds up, could answer a lot of these public choice or Straussian objections. That is, if the way I read what you were saying was perhaps this was part of the conversation at that time, that the, those who feared federal power spotted this and were worried about it, raised it, but then the thing got ratified anyway, is a problem then. It's amended by the Tenth Amendment, which could trump the whole thing. I'm still not persuaded on the text point. In this, I'm kind of me-tooing what Chris Green and Ed Whalen said, and, uh, and and also now what David's comments, you know, supplemented. You, you were arguing, I understand it, that there there's just has to be a difference between powers of the vested in the government versus Congress's powers or those of the president. And just I'm, I'm not yet persuaded by that because it seems to me that the government consists of you know some combination of the Congress, the executive, and the judiciary. And so why couldn't that language referring to powers of the government be a convenient umbrella or catch-all for the powers that are referenced later? And I'm just scanning through my PDF that I use in class, and you know, there are powers vested in Congress in Article II to regulate certain minor things. There are obviously powers vested in the judiciary, the president, et cetera. And then beyond that, I mean, if, and just looking at the text, I mean, the very fact that it says all and all other powers and then I would, building on what David said, all of the powers vested by the Constitution, 
that text itself, you just, when you zero in closely on it, suggests they're the same kind of powers as the foregoing powers <coughs> listed in clauses 1 to 17 of, our, of section 8. I mean, it says, you know, the ex carrying execution, the foregoing powers and all other powers. It just, it doesn't imply to me that this is a different type of power. It seems like more of the same. Um, and then another thought, and this just shows this discussion is really great because it just makes me go back and rethink things that were always so obvious. On the preamble, I've heard a number of suggestions, and you know, this has been in the literature for years, that the preamble might be viewed as articulating some general purposes of government. And on the point that was raised, like about Ilya's political ignorance, and that people at the time might have thought you pull them, they might think, well, yeah, the, this new constitution seems to empower the federal government to ensure the general welfare, establish justice. And I can't shake my students loose from that. Every, every time you st I start off in college, I just taught delegated powers a couple nights ago, and the students are like, well, yeah, the federal government has the power to protect safety and the general welfare. And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> you know, that's, and so I have to, you have to overcome that. But when you really look at the preamble, maybe one way to think about that is the preamble is not phrased as a set of federal powers or goals. It's goals to be achieved by the people through ordaining the Constitution. And the Constitution includes a framework, federal powers and state powers, limits on both. Maybe one way the people are going to establish justice, promote the general welfare, is by limiting federal power as well as granting some of it by creating the whole structure. And so in that sense, that that could be an antidote to the tendency to, to use the preamble as this tempting source of implied federal powers. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Alex? Can I start because <coughs> Michael uh, Paulson directed the question first at me. So Rickard B. Filburn, um, let me answer your question by saying there is a critical difference between the word commerce and the word economics. Economics is an umbrella term. It, it, it covers everything. Uh, uh, I mean, economists study everything for the ultimate effect it's going to have on the production and distribution uh, of goods. Commerce is a subset of economics. Um, it's activities that are geared toward the market, and that's why I really deplore the tendency of the court and scholars to equate commerce and economics. It's not the economics clause. If it were, then Congress could regulate everything, because economics concerns everything. Um, now, if you read 18th century writers like, for instance, Adam Smith, uh, uh, they draw a sharp distinction between commerce, between producing, say, producing stuff uh, for the market um, uh, ver versus household stuff, which they considered beyond the scope of legislative power. There's also sort of a liberty and privacy aspect here. Um, so in Wickard v. Filburn, I recognize that Congress can regulate the sale of wheat in the market, um, but they can't get down to the micro level of Roscoe Filburn growing wheat to use on his farm, you know, for baking bread. That's not commerce. Um, would an economist say, well, Bob, that's simplistic, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, sure, but, 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 but that's not what the Commerce Clause is about. Rach is the same. You know, Congress can regulate the buying and selling of marijuana, they can regulate, you know, growing marijuana to sell, but I don't think they can regulate the mere growth, possession, and use for, you know, personal uh, 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 purposes. So I just want to ma make that point because I think it's an important one. Once you can see the Commerce Clause applies to economics generally, the game is over. So I agree with you on that. If, that, if that's your view of commerce, power, then, then Congress is pretty much unlimited. So I'll start with Brian's uh, question. And I think that's a really interesting reading of the preamble. I hadn't thought of that. I, I like that as a, a kind of an alternative uh, construal. The, the people are uh, ordaining the Constitution to achieve purposes, but it doesn't necessarily follow that the government that they're creating is designed to achieve those purposes. It's on the contrary, by limiting the government, the purposes will be achieved by other means. I think that's interesting. I need to think about that. Um, but let me just mention that, um, uh, it, uh, give you some of the evidence why I think this preamble is important. It was uh, actually a fairly frequent argu argumentative move. So in Chisholm, both Justice uh, Wilson and Chief Justice Jay appeal to the objects of the preamble in kind of explicating 
uh, the powers of the national government. Chisholm, remember, is the first case really where the justices start doing political philosophy and kind of laying it out there. Here's what we think of this new government. Both Chisholm and, J uh, uh, excuse me, both Jay and, and Wilson point to the preamble. Joseph Story uh, has this remark about the oral argument in uh, McCulloch being the greatest speech he had ever heard. He was referring to Pinckney, former U.S. Attorney General uh, Pinckney's argument, not Webster's. And if you go back to Pinckney's argument in McCulloch, it's pretty dramatic. And one of the reasons it's pretty dramatic is because he puts the preamble out there. He said, look, let me tell you how powerful this government is. And he starts with the purposes of the preamble, and he goes through the enumeration, and he says, a government that can do all of this, and he's clearly linking to the preamble, um, uh, and, and now Maryland wants to tell us it's really not much of a government. It, you know, it's, it's really back to the Confederation. Um, in Wilson's Law Lectures, I commend this to you all. It's just a couple pages. It's in the volume here that Kurt has, uh, the Liberty edition of Wilson's Law Lectures. He has a, a, a nice explication of the powers of the legislative, executive, and judicial departments. And he, in his chapter on the legislative department, walks through the enumerated powers. And he makes a case for why the enumerated powers each link back to the different parts of the preamble. He actually organizes the enumerated powers with reference to the six purposes of the preamble. That's relevant. Um, and then Madison, I mentioned uh, in the Bill of Rights speech, he also it seems to allude to the preamble when he talks about the purposes of the government. So all this might just be um, one part of the data set. Right? I, I don't deny that there are many other statements where people are saying, no, no, this government absolutely isn't one uh, that's uh, empowered to, to achieve those purposes. Story in his commentaries has a, has a remark to that effect. There's a Supreme Court case later on where in dicta, one of the justices says, no, the, the preamble doesn't give any powers, and that's the standard line. But I am saying it's a mixed story at a minimum. We need to come to grips with, with all of this. Um, and I'll just say briefly, Michael, I think that's a fantastic example. <laughs> uh, no one state is competent to decide what the flag of the United States looks like. And by extension, a bunch of other national symbols. Those are necessarily powers of the US government, not the president, not the Congress, but the government. And then the all other powers provision gives Congress expressly the legislative power to carry those into execution. Um, and Jennifer, on your comment, I mean, I just don't have a great um, cabined, coherent story to tell yet about just what goes in and what comes out. I've given some ideas for you know, what might go in. But I, I absolutely recognize that at the end of the day, to make any of this um, matter, I think, in adjudication, for sure, one would want to provide structure and, and a kind of a principled account of what goes in and what goes out. I don't have that yet. Uh, just a couple of things. Now, we're, we're really getting to the nitty-gritty um, uh, in terms of how we deal with this text, how do we resolve uh, particular ambiguities about the text in terms of necessary, uh, necessary and proper, um, just on that, that particular point. Um, and this is something that I've talked about, um, uh, that I've shared with John, um, and, and that John, John knows about. But I think it goes, um, it goes to the point about um, what did he mean when he said all other powers, you know, vested in the government of the United States. And you can view that as, um, Best in the government in general, um, in all governments, kind of a, a, a reference to um, uh, unenumerated powers or inherent powers. Or, as it has been more traditionally read, it's simply a reference to those powers vested in the different branches of the government here in this Constitution. And, and although we may disagree with this, I think that evidence um, in favor of the latter comes from James Wilson himself. Um, in the same draft of the Constitution, in which he drafts out the Necessary and Proper Clause and talks about that all other powers provision, um, this is in Second Paran, um, page 163, for those of you with an internet connection that just want to, you know, jump to it. Um, he defines government in the beginning of his draft. It's not in a provision that ultimately makes it to the final draft of the Constitution, but it's part of this draft that includes his Necessary and Proper Clause. Um, and it starts with uh, provision one, the style of this government shall be the United States of America. Two, the government shall consist of supreme legislative, executive, and judicial powers. So that's his definition of government, and I think one way to read that 
is that, so later on when it says all other powers vested in the government, well here he defines government. Government are those powers vested by this constitution in the legislative, executive, and, and judicial branches. Um, so this, I think this is good support for those who have taken the traditional reading that the reference to the government, powers vested in the government mean power vested in these three, uh, these three branches. Um, as far as the, um, um, as far as the, the preamble goes, um, and again, yes, I did bring my James Wilson uh, with me. You know, I know, okay, Akhil will be happy, you know, to know that, yes, I have brought my copy of the Constitution. Okay, but, you know, no constitutional scholar these days can go anywhere without James Wilson. Everyone, please show your Constitution. There you go. It's, a, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's there. there. Thank you. God, I feel better. But in the section where he talks about the preamble, he said, I think he says some very interesting things that, again, puts a different gloss on what James Wilson is, is trying to do. Um, he talks about, um, I now come to the last head under which I propose to treat the powers of the legislative department. Um, and he begins this section by saying, listen, there are sweeping clauses in state constitutions. We do not have a sweeping clause um, in the federal constitution. Uh, we discover a striking difference between the constitutions of the United States and that of Pennsylvania. By the latter, each house of the General Assembly is vested with every power necessary for a branch of the uh, legislature of a free state. In the former, the federal constitution, no clause of such an extensive and unqualified import is to be found. The reason is plain. The latter institutes a legislature with uh, general, the former with enumerated powers. Those enumerated powers are now the subject of our consideration. Um, at that point, he now then links the preamble to each of the enumerated powers. He says things like, Another great end of the national government is, quote, to ensure domestic tranquility, end quote. That it may be enabled to accomplish this end, Congress may call forth the militia to suppress insurrections. And he does this point by point. So he begins by saying we don't have a sweeping clause in the federal constitution. Instead, we have a constitution of enumerated powers. We do have a preamble, but the preamble doesn't it op open it up to unenumerated powers. Here's how the purposes of the preamble are to be effectuated, and you go into the enumerated, enumerated uh, powers themselves. Um, so again, no, I don't think that Wilson was always consistent on this, and John and I have, have talked about this. I think that Wilson at different times did believe in the inherent powers um, of the government, but I, don't, I think it is not necessary to read the text as meaning or referring to anything other than the powers which are actually vested and enumerated um, in the text itself. All right. Um. The next trio is Stanley Fish, me, and Stephen Sachs. Point of information and a comment. And the compliment is, uh, and it's been made before, uh, to the very high level of discussion uh, and research uh, that is evidence in these papers and the comments. I spend a lot of time trying to explain to people what exactly is distinctive about academic activity as opposed to, say, political activity or therapeutic activity or commercial activity, a very long list. Uh, I could save myself a lot of time and trouble by just making everyone attend uh, these sessions. Uh, the comment, not the comment, the point of information uh, has to do uh, with the discussions of uh, enumerated and unenumerated powers. Uh, this may be a point of information already available uh, uh, to many of you, but there is a discussion in theology that pretty much models uh, these debates, and that's the discussion of the doctrine of things indifferent, uh, or as it's often called, the, given its Greek name, the doctrine of the adiaphora. And the doctrine of things indifferent uh, pose, uh, juxtaposes, or rather opposes, the expressed commands of God and then, of course, there can be a large debate about exactly what they are, uh, and, those, and everything else, and everything implied. Uh, and the general debate is about whether everything that is not an express command um, of God belongs to the magistrate, uh, in which case uh, you'd have uh, a strong state control, or belongs to individuals, in which case you'd be moving strongly uh, in the direction of uh, encouraging private activity. So that might be useful for some uh, who want to uh, further explore or frame this situation. And finally, my comment 
is a comment on Steve Smith's comment on John's paper. Uh, and that has to do with the, with the as, Steve, uh, as Steve put it, if I, I try to write it down, uh, uh, speaking to the possibility that there might have been a certain kind of stealthy, loyally, lawyerly construction uh, uh, going on. Uh, and Steve said, well, let's suppose that that's what they intended, but they didn't intend anyone to understand that that was what they intended. Uh, and he uh, then posited the inability of uh, various versions of originalism uh, to deal with that situation. And I'm, I want to deliver the good news uh, that intentionalism, <laughs> that is attentionalist originalism, uh, the, uh, tr the, 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 the true kind, uh, can, uh, can easily deal uh, with this, though not, though, though not in a finally satisfactory way which is not a weakness but a strength. And here's how it goes. Uh, that what you do when you have, when you have, when, when a group of people have uh, constructed something uh, in a way uh, that is at least ambiguous and perhaps constructed strategically uh, so that many different constituencies will feel comfortable with it and therefore allow it to pass. And then you ask the question, what does it mean? What intentionalist originalism will tell you? That there's no way to answer that question. That is, that that question now doesn't have an answer. Just as there would be no way to answer the question if Michael, who has now stepped out of the room, and John, who is still uh, in the room, had uh, in, their, uh, in their new book or in their previous articles actually had entirely different ideas about what the articles or the books were about. And if that were then revealed and you asked then the question, well, what does the book mean? You could not have an answer. So that the strength of orig attentional originalism is that it not only uh, acknowledges, but is perfectly happy to acknowledge the possibility of interpretive failure. That it just might not work. That you might, that in fact, the strategy of an author or set of authors might have been the strategy of trying to defeat intentional, uh, in, intentional uh, inquiry, which again would mean that the answer to the question, what does it mean, is still the right answer. A text means what its author or authors intend, but in this particular situation, that's a question that you cannot answer, and you're going to have to go to some other device which is what everybody on, in the room who is not an intentionalist, originalist, is always doing, going to some other device. Okay, well, I, I, I was next on the list, and, and one of the points I was going to make is the point that Stanley just made, so I will take that out. I, can, I, I, had, an, I had a very homely illustration of this. I'll just, I'll just give you, you think about it, you know, where, where you... Um, you know that when you when you tell your 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 son Sam we're going to go to the park, Sam is thinking the park with the uh, with with the baseball diamond on it and so forth. And when you tell Sarah, your daughter, you're going to the park, she thinks of the of a different park that has a roller skater rink, which she likes to do. And so you say to your kids, "Shall we go to the park today?" And they both say yes. And then the question is, well, what did they what did they approve? And the answer is nothing, right? It's, 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 the, right, it's the right question. The, an, the right answer is that, you know, there's, their, their approval is meaningless. It's made, you know, if, um, and if you took it, if you went to either one of those parks and, and said, well, this is what you approve, you know, one of them would say, no, this is not what I approve. And you knew that when you, when you did it. Um, I, I, there are a lot of things I, I wanted to comment on, but I'm just going to just direct two to Jack. So, in, in the discussion of the meaning of commerce, uh, the debate you're having with, uh, with, with Bob, um, I thought what I heard you say, at least at, in one point, was that, you know, what do we do? We have this, this, this new knowledge, new technology, and, you know, it, 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 it would be good if Congress had a power to over it 
And we could get that power if we gave the term commerce this sort of broad meaning. And I, I mean, I was struck by the form of the argument. The argument is that if, if something is desirable, therefore it exists, which is not, you know, uh, uh, you know normally a, a good argument. Um, and indeed, it, it's not even clear why you would why you would then go back and try to find another meaning of commerce in a dictionary of the late 18th century, because you're really not interested in what they, they meant by the term commerce then. What you're interested in is what would be a desirable meaning, what would be a desirable legislative power to have now, which, which uh, you know, you can invent a word uh, for them. Yeah. Uh, the, other, the other question I was gonna ask, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of sort of, you know, counterintuitive and paradoxical arguments, but when I think about the enumerated powers in relation to, uh, you know, Resolution 6 or, or you know, the, the sort of what the, the Europeans would call the doctrine of subsidiarity or something, right? Um, and it seemed to me, you know, it, it seems, it almost seems so obvious that, that you know, I'm now, I'm now rethinking how obvious is it, but, um, that what you have, e even if the basic principle behind the enumerated powers is the principle of subsidiarity or that standard, that doesn't mean that the principle is either enacted or, you know, normally if you, if you want to do that and you want to give, you know, you want to list some powers, you would then have a residual clause. You would say in anything else, right, that, that uh, the, the federal government would need to have, that the states are incompetent and so forth. Um, that's the normal way you would do that. We do have that with traffic laws, where you say, you know, drive 55 and so forth and so forth, and in addition, you must drive safely. So we we don't have just a general standard. We have some we have some we have some rules, and then it and it's 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 you know a standard picks up the rest. But we don't have that in the Constitution. Um, it's it's you know there are lots of reasons why you may have rules that don't entirely capture the background standard that they're meant to to implement and we can understand why you would have rules and it, it seems to me that that's the, the sort of obvious way of reading the enumerated powers uh, rather than reading them as sort of a an incomplete you know implementation of what's really in the Constitution, which is the sort of doctrine of a uh, principle of subsidiarity. Stephen. I think that, the, and it builds up some of the other questions that have been asked thus far, so I'll try to avoid sort of overlapping too much, but I think there are really at least four claims going on in your paper and, and sort of very much simplifying. The first is that there are really three things going on in the necessary and proper clause. I think that's totally accurate. I think it's a very useful contribution to say that. Um, the second thing is to argue that the, and this sort of builds on the last, that the government provision is not the same as the department or officer provision plus the foregoing. I think I would buy that too. Um, and some of them are, are textual situations. So you could say that Article 4, Section 4, the Republican form of government clause, protecting each of the states against invasion, those are things that are directed to the United States as a whole rather than any particular department. It could be that multiple departments will have to work together to make that happen. And the, it could well be that the, the government provision says that Congress gets to do what it needs to do to carry those things into execution. That, that if, if not supplying powers, it at least implies powers to do the things that the U.S. is obliged to do. Um, and so uh, Congress can carry that into execution. So there might be a couple others. I mean, who know? I, I don't know well enough, but maybe the Fugitive Slave Act um, could be described as an attempt by Congress to carry into execution something the U.S. government had to have happen but was not given any other specific power to do. Maybe not. Um, I think that that would be a, a, a potential candidate there. Then there's a third claim, which is that vested by this Constitution includes not only implied powers but also inherent powers <coughs> that aren't really spelled out by the Constitution anywhere or implied by its terms. I'm, I'm more shaky on that. 
I think it's possible, but it's not necessarily guaranteed to be true by the text. There might be these inherent powers you just get by virtue of being a government, and maybe that's you know, where they come in. But then the fourth claim, and I think what a lot of people are responding to is the most controversial claim, is what exactly those inherent powers are. Um, and I think that there are, um, you know, not, not to try and sort of force everything into my own framework, but you could call, if you think that that's what it's talking about, you could call that an incorporation by reference, which is incorporating by reference all the other inherent powers that come in. And people didn't need to agree on what those were to agree on a constitution that incorporated them by reference. So you could say, yeah, everybody wants Congress to have the power to implement all the stuff that gets vested somewhere, but we don't really know what those are, and, and maybe we can disagree on that. It can be, you know, one of Sunstein's incompletely theorized agreements. Um, the advantage of recasting it in that way is it avoids sort of the Straussian era esoteric re reading that all of these giant important powers are actually loaded into a provision that's only one third of a clause that's only one eighteenth of a section that's only one eighth of an article that's one seventh of the entire constitution and yet it's the one doing most of the work. Um, and so the, the mountains into molehills sort of problem is avoided if you say, no, we're just incorporating other stuff by reference. The big fights happen somewhere else. They're not all loaded into this one, you know, handful of words that, and we can settle those other debates with other historical resources, not just trying to do a reading of a particular provision. Um, but I think that being said, it still means that the, the decision we come to might be very different than the one that your paper puts forward. I think the parts that have been made, the points that have been made that the preamble doesn't necessarily imply powers so much as purposes would be strong, and strong reasons to think, you know, maybe Wilson just got it wrong about what those other powers were and his status as the drafter of the government provision doesn't give him any particular control over the, the substantive question of what those other powers were. Before we, I, I, we have two people who haven't not repeaters on the queue. You have John and, and Mark. If you want to just get your your questions in now, so we can. Sure. My question is really just going to be to Vera and give John a bit of an time to answer. I didn't think I heard an answer to a question I really had. Very much like Steve Smith's question, which was, what is the theory of interpretation uh, that uh, would make us follow this? And I didn't. Quite hear and hear an answer to that, and the idea that you gave, well, that most people would have thought that's what the preamble meant. I don't think that is our theory of anyone's theory of originals, but I don't think that's probably factually correct. But I just was interested with this papers and cast. It's very interesting historically, but not as a theory of interpretation. I just wanted to hear your answer to that. Mark, uh, this is just an observation about <clears throat> something that's come up. I think now twice which I think described as the Article 5 conversation stopper. The Article 5 conversation stopper is, well, if you don't like this result, there's something in the Constitution that you can use to come to the conclusion you do like, just amend the Constitution. <clears throat> All I want to note is that that's a, a, an argument that doesn't have anything to do with originalism. So if Frank Michaelman says the Constitution properly interpreted means that you have to, the government is obliged to engage in Rawlsian redistribution, and you don't like that result, well, amend the Constitution. You know, it's not an argument against um, uh, Michaelman's theory that there's a way to, okay, or, and it's not an argument for originalism, that if it generates bad results, you, result, results that some particular person doesn't like. There's a mechanism for dealing with it. It's just orthogonal to the issue. All right, panelists, last last gasp here. Right. Quickly. Why well, I, I? If you want to, I can do it really quickly. I hope. Uh, so the book has a distinction between interpretation and construction. Interpretations. Uh, the question is, what's the original meaning? If there's ambiguity in interpret in original meaning, then you're permitted to rely on the traditional lawyer's tools, text, history, structure, consequences, etc. Um, and then once you've fixed original meaning, you're permitted then to engage in construction. Construction also uses traditional lawyer's tools. The long form of the argument I make in the book, which I condensed here, was there's an ambiguity in original meaning. Uh, there are at least three different possible concepts that commerce could be pointing to. In order to choose between them, 
you are allowed to use the traditional lawyer's tools of text structure, history, consequences, blah, 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 blah. It so turned out that the arguments that I was making were arguments from consequences, but I also made arguments from text, intertextuality. I also made arguments from structure. In fact, I just did the whole kit and caboodle. The only one you focused on was consequences. That's fine. Uh, and then what I did is I went on and I, I engaged in construction, which I used the traditional lawyer's tools. And the whole idea is you try to make it look seamless, moving from the question of interpretation to the question of construction, so it all looks organic. It all has hermeneutic circle. That's basically what I did. And you just picked out a little thread of it and said, oh my god, he's looking at consequences. And that's not what I was doing. Did he? Well, I, I guess as long as there's a pause, just one, one final thought. I'd, Mark, I might, I might challenge that just, just a bit. Um, about Article 5. I mean, generally, I, I agree with you. The fact that you can amend the Constitution doesn't, um, doesn't change. Um, it doesn't change. It doesn't give you an interpretive theory. But I think it does suggest something which I ended my article with that James Wilson talked about, that Madison talked about as well, that they had a choice. They had a choice between a Constitution of perfect powers or a Constitution um, of maximal rights. And by choosing enumeration, they chose the risk of not adding enumerated powers. By choosing a constitution of enumerated powers, they accepted the risk that they would not have added all the powers that were really necessary. Thus, of course, um, uh, making it appropriate to include, uh, leave the door wide open to amendment by way of Article 5. Um, it doesn't completely answer your question, but I think it is a suggestion, and it fits with other things we know about uh, the statements at the time of the founding, that this was not meant to be um, a perfectionist power um, document. Well. It's, it's lunchtime, and so I want everyone to thank all of these people.